Governor Juguna Ndungu, yes. it's a pleasure to host you today. You. You're hosting this conference, Ready for Takeoff. Yeah. Can you just tell us briefly what, what was the reason behind it? I know it's been a phenomenal success, but what was the thinking behind it? Okay. I think uh, the background to it is that um, four years ago, the program with the fund came to an end. And obviously we started thinking, where should we, how should we structure our engagement with the fund? It was a pro problematic uh, program because uh, the targets were not met. There were so many serious, uh, should I say, constraints in terms of meeting the targets. So the decision by the government and the then Minister for Finance, that's now the President, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, thought that the best thing is to construct, to develop our own program, and then ask IMF to fund it. Essentially, IMF funds balance of payment support. But obviously, it's a very important aspect because that's where Kenya was facing balance of payment support. Now, the short of the story is that that program was funded by the IMF. The government developed the program, requested the IMF to fund it, and they funded it. They funded it. The tune of funding was about, uh, uh, it's now, total, the total of it is about $740 million. But the most important thing is that in the middle of it, we also faced severe shocks, external shocks, and that is 2011. And then we went back to the IMF and said, we want you to enhance, because we are now, the shocks are more severe than we anticipated, we want you to enhance. That's why it is, then they came up with an enhancement, which was quick disbursement as, as well. So, the bottom line is that this is a, a program developed by the government, the, as requested the IMF to fund, and has produced fantastic results. In fact, the first thing, the first result is that it is the first program with the IMF to be ever completed in the history of Kenya. Mm. And we have, just like yesterday, the IMF made it clear that we have, the final review is uh, starting uh, tomorrow. Uh, on the, on the, yeah, start, the mission is here. After this conference, they'll start the final review. And we have met by a clear margin all the requirements, all the targeted variables. So essentially, it's a, it's, it's a history in the making that we have finalized the first program with IMF. It's a success story because it's also a program that was developed by the government. But the other side of it is, is that while all this is coming up, it is being repackaged in a different way. Kenya's policy environment is coming of age. That's one. The credibility of government programs is coming of age. That's why when we looked at all the aspects, both where the IMF program, uh, the, 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 the program of the government with the IMF touches, and also other uh, areas of uh, policy, we are seeing credibility, we are seeing cohesiveness, we are seeing the Vision 2030 is now getting very well coordinated. This is the better time to ask the question, is the Kenyan economy ready for a takeoff? Because this is where we are. Mm -hmm. After all that, f those four years of concerted effort, three years of the program, and uh, making sure that you live to the credibility of the program, then it is showing that actually Kenya has come of age. And that is why we are asking, Kenya is ready for a takeoff. But the first thing in the conference was, let's celebrate those successes. Let's look at what are the prospects for the future and what are the challenges we need to deal with. And you can see all the aspects of uh, the conference, all the sessions have been, what are the challenges? What are the prospects? And where do we go from here? So we want to define our agenda from here. And that is where, where the takeoff comes in. But at the end of the day, I also want to celebrate one more aspect. Kenya has developed very strong institutions. And for me, I revolve around institutions. And I said in the conference very clearly, institutions, strong institutions are very are required in every country in developing world, in African countries more importantly. I made one uh, proclamation which is true. It is an institutional failure problem. When you see poverty in a, in a country, it's an institution failure problem, an institutional failure problem. Why institutions? Because institutions define the appropriate rules of the game. Two, institutions define the appropriate incentives. It is incentives and penalties that encourage prudent behavior in the marketplace. 
And I can say that as a regulator. I give incentives on one hand, but I'm also holding the stick on the other side. So it is the, the appropriate incentives and penalties that encourage prudent behavior in the market. That's why I can proudly talk about the successes in the financial market because I have seen it all. We have used the innovations in the market, we have used the rules of the game, but we have used the incentivizing process to make sure that we encourage prudent behavior in the market. That's where Kenya has come from, and that is why we are looking forward in terms of where should Kenya go. This is the takeoff. I, I think you would you tell me that you know some years ago in the 90s you said that institutional stability was a key uh, a, a key thing uh, for the success of someone like Kenya. Yeah. And I saw recently that the World Bank ranked us as the top sub-Saharan African country for yeah. institutional competence. Yeah, yeah. So I think that really confirms yeah. that confirms that, yeah. Governor. You know, you're seen. Uh, worldwide as, as being a regulator who allowed mobile money mm -hmm. to take off. This is one of the great successes of Kenya. Wherever I go in the world, yeah. you know, people know about, well, admittedly they know about Safaricom because their platform is so big. What were the ingredients for success from your side mm -hmm. that allowed this to happen in a way that it has not happened? in any other African country, where we have this financial inclusion rate you showed on the chart, which is off the charts for our per capita GDP. One of the things you should look at is that um, we, in a segmented market like ours, the biggest problem is why was everybody being kept away from the market? I started the debate in terms of financial inclusion in 2004. You remember mm. when Kenjen went into the market, yes. wanted to raise uh, through an IPO, a rice issue, we wanted to raise funds through an IPO. That's right. What happened? It created a brief in the market. Mm -hmm. I called my friend Adan Mohammed in Barclays and I asked him, did you see this? Yes. What do you think of it? I'm trying to think. I said, look, Kenyans want to save mm -hmm. and they want to invest. The problem is that they cannot save and invest in huge projects. You need to give them projects that they can slice mm -hmm. in pieces they can afford. And that's what an IPO does. The next thing is to say, but how can Kenyans save when you're creating so many barriers to entry? So when a product called M-Pesa came into the market that Kenyans can transfer money across each other, it's so difficult to transfer money if you don't have a bank account, it was a, a product that we looked at. Let's look at the characteristics. There, was a there were challenges in the role. But Kenyans were already using airtime as a quasi-money, isn't it? So the best thing is not to encourage a quasi-money product. The best thing is to encourage a real product that you can regulate. Now, what are the safeguards? The safeguards is that the moment two things happen. There's a communication law. Although people bashed it because the media looked at it from the point of view, but they didn't see other aspects. One of them is that the communication bill legalized electronic signature. The communication bill legalized electronic units of money. So it was easy for you to turn money. How do, you, how do I trade money just like airtime? The first thing is to turn money into electronic units of money. When it is turned into an electronic units of money, it is backed up by the bank, into, into the bank. And because central bank, we regulate banks, they are comfortable. It's a deposit, isn't it? So that was one of, try to see whether there are risks. How do you mitigate that? The other risk was, this is a, so many people taking money to one platform. Now you expose deposit insurance. How do you do, deal with that? We, create, we said, you can invoke the trust law, and then you can create different layers of, of uh, insurance. And that worked. Now the biggest problem was, what about the banks? The bank said, this is a mobile wallet. It's going to snatch business away from us. I told them, no. It is going to help you as a platform. It will become a platform. Right now you are seeing it as a product, but it will be a platform that you can integrate with. It's a platform where people can withdraw money from their bank accounts into the mobile phone for use payments of goods and services. Later years, we got a criticism that you're working so well, it is working, but it's not affecting the banking industry. It is not affecting the intermediation of banks. Mm. So what were they saying? It is still a platform for pay in, pay out. Mm. And the average amount that time was about 2,600. Sure. This right now it has jumped to 6,000 because now people are paying goods and services. So 
All of a sudden, the banks realized that this was not our rival. This was a, an enhancement of the services that we give. So all of a sudden, they joined in. Now, the biggest problem is that there is a still misunderstanding. And maybe that's, the, I always like going very simple. Mm. You go to a telecom agent. The first thing I'm being told is that you should supervise the telecom agent. I ask why. Because he's dealing with money. I say, the shopkeeper who is selling sugar is also mm. dealing with money. Should I supervise him? You that see, one. it's not the same. I say, it's the same. What happens is that the telecom agent, you give him your cash. He converts it into electronic units of money. You see it in your mobile phone. You walk away. In the meantime, the cash he has transferred is also led directly and backed up in the bank, isn't it? So just like the shopkeeper, you gave out your money, you got the sugar. The shopkeeper sees his sugar stock is going down, but his money stock is going up. So it's time to go and replenish the sugar stock. It's the same thing they are doing. That's one aspect. We don't need to regulate the telecom agent because the CCK is doing the job. We already have an agreement what to do. That's the first thing. The second thing is, what exactly happens when you visit the telecom agent? He takes your money. He has rules of the game. He has the equipment that has been given by the company. He takes your money and changes in electronic units of money. He's helping you. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to go to the bank to bank that money and then you can actually be withdrawing it through an electronic unit, he's helping you to do it with the phone that you're holding. So it's a small operation that is taking place, but it has made the difference. It's made a huge difference. So, but then, as we, since we are still in the subject, I saw it would move into a platform rather than a product. Mm. I saw that it is going to be a process where you can transfer money person to person, person to business, mm. because you can even, and business to people, because you can also pay, get salaries, or even, uh, you can even uh, pay uh, uh, services, mm. or even receive dividends. And then, all of a sudden, I saw that you can also now use it as, as a platform to save money. The beauty about the platform to save and receive credit is that it moves you from minute one account, minute one trust account, to one to one account, because all those features, the other aspect is that everybody KYC requirements are already there. They are electronically fitted there. We can even move to the next level and say, do you, see your, do you want to see your picture shows up? Mm -hmm. But you see, the question is what we want to be using it for. But the most important thing is that when we move to the platform of savings and credit, then you now have a one-to-one -one mapping, mm -hmm. and we are increasing the number of accounts. That's why you saw the deposits account have increased tremendously to over 19, mid, uh, 19 million. Mm -hmm. And it's because now we have seen that you have trusted the system, the system is working, it is cost effective, it is solving the cost of physical distances. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Well, I remember we used to have to send money in the car to the village, and now today you were telling me you're paying your workers on the yes. farm, right? I, I, in the, on Saturday afternoon, what is how many kilos of tea have you picked? How many laborers were there? Mm. And they are, these are their accounts. Mm. Pump, pump, pump. In five seconds, they receive the money. Um, mm. Before that, somebody used to travel all the way from the rural area to Nairobi to receive the money. Governor, I know we're under time constraints. I'm just going to ask you to say, you know, give, give your impressions of the conference, what we heard today. You know, this headline, the hashtag Kenya for Red, is ready for takeoff. I believe it. What would you say? You know, to me, it seems we're at a tipping point for the fortunes of our country. This is what I remember in um, 2010, we came up with a book, uh, policies, Kenya Policies for Prosperity. Essentially, what we did is try to repackage the Vision 2030 policies into a menu of what we should do. It is all contained there. But we have recognized now, we have come this far, but there are still binding constraints. That binding constraint is to say, how do we take everything and the reforms and the institutions, the policies we want to the next level? To the tipping point, what you're really saying is that we have to resolve the binding constraint. Unfortunately, most, most of the binding constraints involve a huge infusion or rollout of public investments, mm. which is infrastructure in nature, to close the infrastructure gap and encourage complementary private sector investment. That's where we are. Mm. I have a, I made a big proclamation, and I say that Kenya 
is serving six red-rocked, relatively resource-rich countries. What you need is not to discover oil or what. What you need is create transit airports to allow the region to travel, create efficient ports, create road networks and railway networks. And when all that is done, and the banks, of course, they have covered the region very well, we now move, have to move banks to the next level. Ask for stronger banks. Stronger banks, they can serve the market niche very easily. We can create strong banks by raising core capital, encouraging consolidation. When we get there, then we know we have solved or resolved the binding constraints. That is when we'll be sure about takeoff. That is why this conference is very important, to remind us that we have come this far, but the tipping point requires more resolve in terms of policy reforms, in terms of institutions, in terms of policy packages to move the country to the next level. That's why in the last session I said, we do not want to see whenever there is an infrastructure project, we want to see the government going out to raise debt. No, we can repackage these projects because some of them are bankable projects. Very bankable. Repackage them so that you encourage PPP. Encourage equity to come in so you can have a combination of equity and debt. But if you believe that it's good, there are a lot of literature about growing with debt and we can bring it out. But sometimes the most efficient is also to endogenize the wishes of the private sector. And that's why PPP is becoming very important. The next session we are going to listen to you how to close the infrastructure gap. That's why I'm very interested to see it. For me, everything revolves around closing the infrastructure gap. That reduces the binding constraint. It reduces transactions cost. Government investing in infrastructure reduces transactions cost, enhances the private sector profitability. That is why I always say that the government should drive public investment that are complementary to private investments because they, dis they reduce the transactions cost and encourage profitability of private investment. And that's where we are going. At the end of the day, who makes the wealth? It's the private sector. But we have to make it easy for them to make the wealth. That is lowering cost of doing business and encouraging them by opening up areas. Yesterday we had about cities, expanding cities will create space, will create growth, will increase raise productivity. That's where we are. So we are the tipping point. So thank you very much. Thank you, Governor.